Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 60 of the platform specific series of my ZHC assembly programming tutorials. This is the 5000 sub special episode. We're going to go over part of the source code of the demonstration which is loading up there as you can see. Now basically this is a tape loading demonstration. We're loading data from the cassette in two different and I think relatively interesting ways. This part is basically loading in byte by byte. Now the way the Amstrad CPC seems to work is it loads a chunk block of data into a buffer and then your code can read bytes from that buffer one by one. Um, unfortunately it doesn't seem possible to literally read a single byte from the tape in real time. Um, you would have to disassemble the um, firmware ROM, I think, and actually build your own tape reading routine. Uh, the firmware ROM is very complex, so I'm afraid I wasn't willing to do that for this tutorial, so that's not how we're doing things. So this is the first part. This is, a say, loading byte by byte in effect from the tape. Uh, you can see the first layer, which is the background, and then we're now loading in a second layer, which is the, thanks for 5K subs, there it is. Now, this is um, RLE data. Um, it's basically compressed and um, that's why it loads relatively fast. Now the second part is a second le tape loading example. This time we're streaming what's known as a headerless file. Uh, it's not in blocks, it's just one big file and this is a fairly typical cassette loading. Um, you know, you've you got the loading screens and this is how they used to load, you know, in one big stream. And um, th th this, I believe, is headerless data. Now, you did see some very clever ones which would load each pixel one by one on the screen. And I think they had actually written their own cassette reading routines. And as I say, unfortunately for this tutorial, that was not possible because it would have been too difficult. Now, you'll have seen in the middle of the demo that there was a section with some fireworks. Uh, we're not going to cover that. The reason we're not going to cover that is it's not very well written, I won't lie. Uh, basically, uh, the pixel plotting routine was uh, based on the code that I started writing for Photon and I thought well maybe I can make it into a fireworks routine and I was able to do so but by the time I got to the end I realized well I didn't do that in a very nice way. It works but it's ugly and um, I wouldn't recommend you do it in the same way so we're not going to cover that today. We are going to see the pixel plotting routine and how we can use those to draw lines though as part of the Photon tutorial so hopefully that will suffice for people. Anyway, let's go over to today's source code and let's have a look. Now, the tutorial example is basically in two parts. There is a cassette, which uh, is available for download or you can build it yourself. And there is also the source code. Now we compile the source code into RAM. We just do that there. And then we type call and 4000. Now we're running from a Amstrad 6128, which is a disk based system. This causes us a problem because if we try and load from a tape on a disk based system, it will actually load from the disk. You see, as far as the firmware is basically concerned, disks and tapes are the same thing in the sense that we have commands that work from tape, but if our system is set to load from disk, those same commands will now work from disk. It, it, it kind of switches over and we have the bar tape and the bar disk commands to do this. So bar disk. So bar disk, if I spell it correctly, will switch to the disk mode, which is the default when we reset. And bar tape will load from tape. And if I just do load test, you can see we're now reading from disk and we'll get file not found. But then if I do bar tape and I do load test, well now we get a demand for the cassette. Uh, the, the point I'm making here is that uh, basically it's the same when we're writing our code. The code commands that we're using to read in can read in from tape or disk. It's just that bar tape command that will switch to tape. Now this causes us a problem because the bar tape command, to my knowledge, isn't exposed in any of the firmware functions. We've got firmware functions to read uh, open file headers. We've got firmware functions to turn off system prompts. We don't have a firmware function exposed easily to turn to the cassette on a disk based system. But what we can do is we can basically do a call straight to the command within the disk ROM that does the bar tape command. And that's what we've done here. Now, what we need to do is basically page in the ROM file and then run a certain address and then return. We have a function which is RST3, which is the far call to do this for us. So basically the way we use this RST is we pass it a pointer to a set of bytes. Where are they? Here they are. This is the set of bytes. So this is the format that RST3 expects. First, we have an address that we're going to call. CCFD is going to be the address of the bar tape command that we're going to use to turn the system over to cassette. 
and that is in the disk ROM, which is ROM 7. So ROM 7 will be paged in, and that basically takes up the top quarter of the memory from C000 onwards to FFFF. And then we will call that address, and then we will return. So RST3 with that command there is effectively switching us over to tape. Now it's important to point out this wouldn't work properly on a 64K system. Basically the 64K system has no disk ROM, so this would come up with an error or crash. So if we were going to write a proper piece of code here that would work on any system, we would need to in some way detect if that ROM exists and not to try and page it in if we are on a tape only system. So um, it, it, there's a bit of a sort of Poor bit of coding here, if you will, but as I say, it's just a quick example. But anyway, that's how we can switch to tape. Now, what we've got next is some color setting commands. We're using the firmware here. We set the two colors that we're going to flash between, and we're not using flashing, so both colors are the same here. We're setting the border here, the background, and colors one, two, and three here. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, we're going to start loading a cassette file soon, but we want to turn off any messages that would be shown to the screen. And the option I'm using for this, there's a couple of different options as BIOS set messages and VDU disable. But the one that seems to be sufficient is cast noisy. Now, if we run the cast noisy function at BC6B, we, depending on the accumulator, will turn the messages on or off. A zero will turn them on, a non-zero will turn them off. So we're loading the accumulator with one and we're turning them off. Well, what happens if we disable that, if we leave cast noisy on? Well, if we now do our call and 4000, we've got press play, then any key. And if I press enter here, we press any key. And what we get next, hopefully, is loading cinema.rle block one. Well, that's not going to work very well because that's going to go all over our screen and make a horrible mess. So we don't want to do that. So we're turning cast noisy off and that will stop those messages. Okay, so that's the first thing we're doing there. That's going to turn the messages off. Next, what we need to do is we need to open the actual file on the cassette. We're going to use casin open for that. That will find the file and start as ready to read in data. We're using function BC77 to do that. Now there's a few parameters. We need to pass it a buffer because although we're processing the data byte by byte, the blocks are read in one at a time from the cassette by the firmware. So we're passing A600 here, which is enough space for the 2K buffer. We're passing the B register as zero. Now B is the length of the file name, but zero is a special case. Zero means I don't care what the file name is, just load something. It will load in the next file, which is fortunately for us the correct one, otherwise we might make quite a mess. Now, alternatively, we can specify a file name in HL, and then B would be the length of the file name. Now, if you have a look here at file name here, Now, if you look, we would actually need to specify a file name as uppercase ASCII, which is probably no surprise really. And we would just need to basically specify that like that. Now, this is a 10 byte length string here. So we would need to put B as 10. If we compile again and run just one more time, this code will, I'll just speed things up. This code now still works fine because it's finding the correct file name. However, if I change the file name to something that is not the file, if we change it to cineb, for example, and compile again, let's rewind my tape here with the tape control and do call and 4000 here. Well, now it's not loading. The reason it's not loading is because the file name is wrong and we would see the correct file name. We would see the file name it was finding if we turned cassette noisy off again. But as I say, basically, if we want to specify a specific file name, we can do so. If we just want to load the next file, we can do that as well. Now, specifying a, correct, a specific file name is very handy for your multi-loader games, like your gauntlet type games, where um, you would want to specify the file name level 01, level 02. And that way, if the user's rewinding and fast forwarding a cassette, that you can still get the right file name. And you'd probably want some kind of cast noisy thing where it would show the file name that it had actually found. Otherwise, you know, you would potentially have a problem there where the user wouldn't know what was going on. Interesting to note, I remember Fiendish Freddy on the cassette, the, um, com the computer game, you could actually rewind the tape and play the same levels over and over again and keep racking up score because obviously it wasn't checking its file names. So um, filthy cheaters like me may take advantage of you if you don't check your file names.
Anyway, so we're opening the file with BC77 here, and we're then running the RLE decompress routine. Um, this is something we've looked at before. Basically, this is a very simple RLE decompressor. It uses a one byte header. If the byte is zero, then it's the end of the file. If the byte has a top bit of one, then the data is RLE. There are up to 127 bytes of the same byte, so the one byte repeated up to 127 times. Otherwise, there is what we, I've referred to as linear data, which is uncompressed data, and there can be up to 127 bytes that will all be consecutive in the file. So this is a format we've looked at before. Basically, the files for today's example were created with AccuSpite Editor as usual. You would export them with Z80 and Shred CPC file, save CPC screen, and then you would compress them with the file processor here, RLE data per byte. So that's how you could create the files for today's example. Now, the routine has had a change made to it for today's example. Uh, we're actually ignoring bytes that are zero. Now, the reason we're ignoring bytes that are zero is there is a bit of a transparency effect. Now, I've got some screenshots to show you what I mean by this. Basically, the file is loaded in two layers. The first is the background cinema. The second is the thanks for 5K subs, and these are two layers that are loaded as two separate files. But because the zero bytes here are transparent, the result is this. This file doesn't exist. It's a combination of these two. Now, the zero bytes in this one don't matter because, of course, the screen was black at the start. If the screen wasn't black at the start, well, we would have ended up with a quite royal mess. Now, I can actually show you this if I disable the changing of the screen mode here. If I now run this again if we just compile this and if i do call and 4000 here well you can see now that the screen hasn't been cleared and when the background starts loading in you know we just need to rewind our tape here and start again oh dear i made a minute oh there we go so you can see now that the zero areas are not being cleared and that's the, how the transparency effect is working so that's the only change that's been made to the decompressor from the point of view of the de decompressing code. Now, originally, this decompressor would load in bytes from HL, the, um, which would be the address of the next byte in memory. However, this time, because we're using the cassette, we're loading in with CAS in char at BC80, and this reads in a byte in the accumulator, and it will also corrupt IX, but it leaves all the other registers intact, so it's just fine for our decompression routine, and you can see that's being used here. That's for the header, here for the linear uncompressed data, and here for the single byte that's repeating in the compressed data. So that's how we're able to show the file to the screen. Now, once we've shown one of the files to the screen, we are having to close the file. We use BC7A to do that, cast and close. That will close the file. So we've got two files, basically. The first one here is the cinema, and the second one here is the thanks for 5,000 subs message here, and then we're running the fireworks routine, which is a separate um, a separate assembly file here. Now, that's the first two. So these are being loaded in as blocks of data. The second one is being loaded in as something known as headerless data. So this is not in blocks. This is just one massive chunk of data, and that's how we did that sort of loading screen effect where it loaded all into memory in one byte at a time, basically. So we basically do this with a different function. There is no three parts so before we had the open the process bytes and the close now there is just one part we're using cas read at bca1 now we specify a destination in hl c000 the screen the size 16384 bytes and the header byte uh, also known as the sync byte and this is hexadecimal 16 which is the default of amsdos i believe because you can save these in amsdos now for some reason i was having trouble if the file contained a lot of zeros at the start and i'll be honest i couldn't figure out why i couldn't find any documentation on what the problem was there but um it's just something you might need to need to sort of try out with your own data but um, that will effectively load in the entire screen file into the screen memory from the next file on the tape. It's headerless, so there's no file name. That's why we're not specifying any file name. We physically can't because there's no header. So it's just streaming the next file in straight into RAM there, and it's the size of the file that defines when the read will stop. And there's no close either, so that's the second file. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, how can I make these files? Now, the actual creating of the tape, we used a little program called 
to CDT. Now, I believe this is actually also used for creating um, ZX Spectrum tapes. I think the format's the same. So the batch file I used is here, and the three lines creating the 5K demo are here. Now, we've got a variety of switches here, slash in, minus n defined to create a new file so we're starting a new tape at this point and then we are specifying the source file here and the destination file now the first two are normal blocked files so we specify m0 for normal mode with blocks and the third file is the one that's headless so we specify m1 for headless here now we are specifying the speed as being fast here. We're, we're saving this all as fast data. You can see a breakdown of the switches here. So minus N start a new tape, minus S1 speed 2000 board fast, which is what we want. M0 is block data, M1 is headless data, and T1 is turbo loading blocks, which is all of the default. Now there is actually a way of specifying the sync header byte hexadecimal 16 as well, but we don't need to do that because hexadecimal 16 is the default, both for 2CDT and also for AMSDOS, so that's what we're using here. I, I believe if you used a different one, you would just need to make sure that the sync byte in your file and in the execution of this command matched, and that would all work just fine. So there we go. So that's how we can load in files from tape. Now there is one other option I've not discussed because it's very boring, but uh, basically if you didn't want to load in byte by byte, you can use the function bc83 cas indirect, which will load in an entire file from tape into memory. Um, now, if you want to see more about all these commands, what I'd suggest you do is you get the Amstrad firmware guide. There's a link to it on my Amstrad page of my website. It's really essential for all Amstrad programming, to be honest, and it covers all of these kind of things. And as I said before, these kind of commands will work on a disk-based system in basically the same way if the disk is enabled by the bar disk command or on an Amstrad 6128 if you've just reset the machine and not switched to tape. The, the commands, although they often refer to CAS as cassette, they were uh, extended with the disk ROM to work for disk in the same way. So you know, it's, it's exactly the same really for working with disks. Anyway, there we go. That is the end of the 5000 sub uh, example here. As I say, if you want to see how the fireworks code worked, routines worked, we will look at the pixel plotting and line drawing later on in Photon. Anyway, I really appreciate everyone who subscribed. You know, as I said before in the 5,000 sub video, it's really um, fantastic. So many people are enjoying my content, so I'm going to definitely keep making it. I hope you found some amusement in this video as well, and I wish you all the best with your Z80 and your Amstrad CPC cassette programming. Thanks for watching today, and goodbye.